Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Glenn Brown, Tactical AI. I do apologize if this is a little on the aggressive side, but that's the business we're in. Uh, and right now it's an uncertain world and there is war in Europe again. So it's kind of pertinent. What do I want to talk about today? The reality is I didn't want to talk about anything, but Mark insisted that I do. Otherwise there was going to be no instant coffee. I'm going to talk about the provision of power, electrical power, DC power, at what we term the tactical edge. It used to be known as the front line back in the day. But since we've been hanging out with the Americans more and more, they always have an alternative turn, and they call it the tactical edge. So power at the edge is our concern. I'm going to take you through a little bit of history so you understand the context and where we're at. Where we're at right now in the West, specifically the British Armed Forces, the lessons we're very quickly identifying and we hope learning from Ukraine and what the future holds. Together with our relationship, Tactical AI with ZPN, we think we may have some solutions to some of the challenges that forces are facing, particularly in Ukraine at the moment. So the first use really of DC power in the field was during the Crimean War and they established field telegraph uh, outposts in command centers, headquarters in Crimea. That wasn't really at the tactical edge, that was some distance behind, obviously. And then we looked at 1914 in the emergence of radio, thanks to the work of our friend Marconi, and the first radios were taken into the trenches. And generally speaking, they were used either to pass orders, as opposed to carrier pigeons, which were still in use, right up to the present time, actually. And also, DC power was used in flashlights, and that was also to do with communications. So bardic lamps, that kind of thing, they would send each other coded messages using various filters on a lamp. Then in 1939, with the advance of battery technology and battery chemistries, it was possible to equip a soldier with a radio that he could carry on his back. And for those of you that know anything about the army, that then led to the Royal Signals, who were formed to carry those radios on their backs, becoming known as scaly backs. And the reason for that is the acid would sop out of the battery, down the back of the soldier concerned, and he'd end up with scaly skin. So they're still known to this day as the scalies. Jumping all the way forward from uh, Manpack radios in 1939 and the Second World War, also handheld radios were produced then all the way forward to 2001 and 9-11 and counterinsurgency. So it wasn't really a war. A war as we would know it in the military sense. It was a counterinsurgency, a military operation. Unlike Putin's special military operation, I hasten to add. And a great deal of smart devices and electrical devices requiring battery power were issued to troops on the tactical edge. Actually, there was no front line in either Afghanistan or Iraq. There was for a short time in Iraq, maybe 72 hours. Thereafter, it became a counterinsurgency. Soldiers needed things like hearing protection. They needed their own personal royal radios. They needed things like digital scopes on their rifles uh, and other sensor devices as well were being used, such as night vision goggles, thermal image scopes. All of it required battery power. The solution in those days which you believe was double A batteries. And each soldier would carry about five pound worth of batteries on his person to power all these devices up. In 2004, the British Army decided it was gonna digitize. I still to this day don't know exactly what that means. What it meant to the soldier on the ground is a lot more smart devices were being incorporated into the soldier as a system. The soldier was now seen as a standalone system and the section of eight soldiers, which is the smallest fighting unit in the British Army, that was considered to be a system of systems, essentially. All of it was tied together by digital radio, and that's what was driving it, the necessity to pass data over combat net radio tactical networks. So we had Bowman, and I was involved in that rather sadly, uh, Manpack and handheld sensors. We even had sensors issued for chemical, and biological, radiological warfare, which could be plugged into a radio, which could carry the data back and backhaul it via satellite communications all the way back to Whitehall, should that be necessary. 
We jump forward again to 2020 in the formation of the Future Capability Group, which was user representative, it was the interface, the meat and the sandwich between procurement and the Army users. And that led to robotics and autonomous systems being introduced for experimentation into the British Army and a number of other Western forces, most notably, of course, the Americans. And then we had the formation also of a, an experimental unit in Warminster called Soldier Systems, which attempted to bring clever technology to the soldier. It had to be easy to use, easy to train, easy to maintain. To put that into context, you know, the average reading age of an infantryman in the British Army is that of a 12-year-old. That's not because they're stupid, they're just poorly educated. So stuff has to be easy because everyone's an idiot when they're cold, under fire, and they haven't slept for three days. I am that idiot. And now, contemporary age, we've got the special military operation, now nearly three years old, in Ukraine. And we're watching what the Ukrainians are doing because they are massively outnumbered by the Russians. They're an innovative people. They had traditionally great software writers. They've done some really remarkable things in terms of using commercial off-the-shelf technologies to try and hold the Russians back. So where we are at the moment in the West as far as DC power is concerned, it's always been a requirement at the front line since the inception of the combat net radio or the radio. Uh, as well as torches and other signalling lamps, etc. The requirement for power at the tactical edge has grown exponentially. And you can imagine why that is. I mean, one of the, one of the, one of the key fallback communication means in Ukraine is the mobile phone. And if you think about it, this is the mo most ubiquitous sensor system and processing unit in the world. Everyone's bloody got one. So you can use it. As an aside, when the Ukrainians started facing the threat of Iranian drones sold to the Russians, the Shahid, you'll have seen it on the news, somebody came up with the idea that if they took a number, thousands of defunct uh, smartphones, put them on a two metre pole and turned the microphone on and used the 3G network they had in place with a little app that someone's designed, like in their lunch break, that would detect the audio signal of passing drones accurately. So you could then concentrate forces to take them down because they're not visible particularly well on radar, those things, because they're slow and they're wooden. So there's been a proliferation of digital devices. I've explained what some of those are. Night vision goggles, scopes, uh, very sophisticated MANET, which is mobile ad, ad hoc network radios, for instance, that mesh together. The idea of those things is uh, they produce a battlefield of things. You, you'll have heard of the Internet of Things. And in fact, some of you will be running those at home. There's going to be a battlefield of things. It needs a bearer. It needs a Wi-Fi kind of capability at the front. And therefore, it needs battery power. Now, one of the things I failed to say at the beginning, and I should have done, is traditionally DC power at the front was always produced by a generator. Generators on the modern battlefield are not a great thing because they produce signatures, heat, noise. They're a pain in the ass to lug around. Again, having been that man and burying them doesn't work particularly well either, particularly if you've got where you put it and it's not running. It can be difficult to find, allegedly. <laughs> so you've got to produce power, particularly DC power, of various voltages. I'm not going to get into the metrics of how much is consumed, but the Ukrainians are dealing with it in their own inimitable fashion. And you'll see what that is. So that's really the key point of this. The demand for electrical power at the tactical edge in warfare and in the warfare we're seeing in Ukraine. I mean, it's, it's like the, the other side of a bathtub curve. It's grown massively. And we in the West still don't know how we're going to cope with that. And the Ukrainians are only just coping with it. And I'll show you how they're doing that. So we're on to Ukraine. This is the kind of thing that an eight-man section in Ukraine, because they're organized along NATO lines, you could argue that's one of the reasons they've been successful so far. 
So I'll take you through the, the army is always full of abbreviations, acronyms and assholes. So combat net radio, CNR, PMR is professional mobile radios. You'll see them using Motorola radios as opposed to military standard radios. Military standard radios, incredibly expensive. And, and you know what? They don't work very well. Whereas actually, if you've got a lot of Motorola's, you can maintain comms. 3G and 4G networks, they still rely on. Starlink, right down to the tactical edge, into the section's trench. They will use Starlink. High, high bandwidth, puts out a little puddle of coverage. I was told two years ago when we used Starlink on Salisbury Plain, I was told by a Scalyback, if you remember what those are, by a technician from the Scalybacks, he said, what is that? I said, it's Starlink. He said, Starlink? What kind of throughput are you get in here? So I showed him my phone, it was 238 megabytes per second. Two kilometers away, the British Army had its satellite communications link called Raptor, because everything's called Raptor these days, right? With, it, I think it had a dedicated generator, two dedicated vehicles, and a crew of 12, and it was downloading 12 megabytes per second. But it was military, right? <laughs> Hearing protection is another thing, uh, and it requires power in order to work. Because they calculated after the first Gulf War that about 33% of the British infantry were essentially medically downgraded due to tinnitus, which, now that I've said it, is beginning to buzz in my left ear. And it's generally the left ear because that's the one closest to the muzzle. And I can't say tinnitus without <laughs> it kicking off. Sensors, NVGs, night vision goggles, two categories, image intensifying, you'll see the thermal sight. We've got one scope, uh, a low light camera scope, actually on our stand if anyone wanted to look at it. I've no idea why you would want to look at it. Mine detectors, inevitably, digital scopes we've covered, chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear sensors, also critical. Counter UAV, not so much the sensors, but the effectors the ability to jam these things that are now ubiquitous and they're everywhere. And spectrum analyzers, and that's analyzing the radio frequency spectrum in order to see if there's any activity by the enemy in terms of electronic warfare, that is jamming, or his use of drones. Because the drones tend to be, particularly if they're COTS, they're kind of predictable frequencies they're going to be operating on, and you look for those. It just tells you that there's activity. Because again, those drones, those little drones, cannot be detected by radar which doesn't leave you very, very many options. And the thermal image is tiny because it's four small motors running at two kilometers away looking at you. You're not gonna see that through your rifle scope. So drones, robots, drones, phones, and robots, as we like to say. You'll see on our stand, if you go out there, you'll see a, a typical, it's dual use. It was designed originally as uh, an industry benefit kind of, uh, surveying and surveillance system for security and that kind of thing. The Ukrainians, as you've seen, have bought lots of, generally speaking, their Chinese products because they're excellent and they're really cheap. There are some caveats with regards to security of those things. So you'll see ground control stations, other kinds of controllers, control radios, and also VR headsets, which they tend to use for first-person view drones. So I'm going to show you something now, and there is a warner at the front. There's, there's no blood and guts in this, all right? I, I trimmed it out. There is in the, the real deal. So this is the reality of war in Ukraine today. And I thought I'd be clever and say, stop me every time you see something that uses a battery. And I thought, no, <laughs> we'll never get through it. And, and the vaping, of course. Vaping units need recharging as well, don't they? <laughs> I think.
and battery power. So that, I think, is indicative of where warfare is going. We're looking, I mean, the British Army is looking at this very closely right now. The decision-making cycle is very slow, unfortunately, because you've got politicians sitting above them that are saying, there's nothing to worry about, this will all pass, right? Which is, if I remember rightly, the kind of thing they were saying in 1935. We'll disarm, it'll be fine. The Germans know they're really nice people at the end of the day and Hitler will go away, right? Uh, not so much. So you could see, indicative there, the amount of devices that are using batteries of various chemistries, various outputs. In particular, the drones. Each of those drones had a, a heavyweight battery strapped to it. They all need charging before they use. Those drones are not coming back for obvious reasons, but the, the batteries need charging. It goes on further in the, in, the, uh, in the film, it goes on to say that they used 40 of those drones in one day, and that was the young man that you saw there with a strange haircut, <laughs> vaping his way through the day. 40 drones in one day. It's terrifying. How does that power get to them? It isn't via a generator. You heard, or you rather you read, that they have to move often. And the other thing I draw your attention to is the, as you see the drone approaching the target, the screen goes. That's jamming. And they have jamming too. And those jammers, and I can't show you an example of those, but they, they also need DC battery power. So how do we get it there? Because right now, all the armies in the West are configured, configured to consume fossil fuels. Diesel, generally speaking, and if they need to recharge batteries, they take the batteries to a generator and you sort of queue up, mark your battery so no one else nicks it when it's fully charged, because soldiers will do that. Plug it in and like wait 20 minutes, half an hour, whatever. Clearly that's not gonna be enough. And that isn't the way to do it. There's some work has been done around that using a, you know, a quad essentially as a generator, a hybrid, and people bring their batteries and they're recharged there and they swap them for charged ones. The scale of that isn't really big enough to sustain operations like this. So how are we going to do it? So this is the way the Ukrainians are presently doing it. And these are NGOs that the Ukrainians have established themselves that buy power packs, camping power packs, solar power packs. We've got one out there. I don't know what they are, 1,500 watts per hour, whatever the hell the output is. But I'm told, the middle one, by the way, is something that they're producing themselves. So it's, got a, 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 it's more military standard than the others, which are just cots from Amazon, for God's sake. But I'm told that a unit of eight men, like the one you've just seen, generally has two pilots, and the rest of the guys are doing admin, they're doing the leadership, they're doing communications, and they're doing security for those guys. One of those units will go through one of those power packs a day. I mean, that's significant. And the logistics of that is really quite complex. So all movement in Ukraine is death. Everything is seen all of the time because the sky is full of drones. And they're cheap. They're everywhere. And you can't hide from them. So the only way you can protect yourself is getting underground and not moving. So we're back to World War I in many ways. right? Maneuver warfare is over. I don't know how many times I've seen, you saw the drone attacking that, that tank, because I'm a tank geek, that's what I used to do, is a T-90M. That's, that's nearly three million pounds worth of hardware. And it's not a 500 pound drone, by the way. That'll be nearer a 2,000 pound drone. But even so, the cost effectiveness is astonishing. 
and that thing would have been blown apart. And that's mostly not because it's a tank and all tanks are now vulnerable, that's because it's a Russian tank and they have a major design flaw. That is, they have all their ammunition in a nice little carousel and then they sit the crew on top of that. And if it's hit, and it generally hit at a 45 degree angle rear of the turret, the stream of molten metal and gases hit that ammunition carousel, the whole thing goes up spontaneously. So this is how the Ukrainians are dealing with it. They'll send one man back. He could be on a motorbike and he'll pick up a, a couple of power packs, bungee them onto his bike or carry them and he'll scoot back, generally at night, because neither side has great night capability in terms of thermal images. So that's how they're dealing with it. I think we can do better than that in the future. This is a graphic that ZPM produced. I think it's really quite cool. There's a couple of our drones floating around the top there. But if I just show you at the moment, this is a bit skippy, this one, so I need to push it forward. This is how Western armies rely on getting energy to the front, essentially. Forget the distances, forget the hardware. The principle is there. We take oil, we refine it into diesel, and then we distribute it all the way down the front line in what we would call a jerry can. Strangely, the Germans don't call it that. They call it a 20 litre container, which is fine. What we're proposing is the army, the British army and the American army are determined to electrify. All of their vehicles will be electrically driven in the future. The problem as ever is the range of batteries some of the other safety concerns over batteries as well. But what we're working with ZPN on is understanding the logistics just enough to be able to tempt the military into spending some research money on this because we're not gonna do it off our own back and produce something that is recognizably a jerry can if you're not German. Because everyone's used to that and everyone's used to carrying power forward in the form of a 20 litre container of diesel or petrol. The army, it's still called POL, which is petroleum and oil and lubrication. So it'd be pretty much like the power pack, but in this format, and it's in that format for a reason. And the reason is, if I can get this to move forward, apologies. That's not where it should be. That is not it. So, cutting to the chase. That's everything that's gonna recharge. It's pretty much the whole gamut of equipment now that ordinary infantry soldiers can be expected to be exposed to, trained on, maintain, and use at the front. The jerry can itself on every NATO vehicle so NATO has a set of standards called STANAGs. It's where they agree that something has to be this shape, size, weight, color, etc. It's a bit like the EU for the army. So every vehicle has a 20 liter, a jerry can holder, at least one. Some of them, like the Supercat Jackal, have like 10, and that's how they have extensive range. So producing something in that format for soldiers, you immediately establish an empathetic link. They know what it is. It's gonna to have to be a different color. It'll need an interface. It needs to be flexible in terms of how it's recharged, where it's recharged. But ZPN, I think, have a solution to that. One of the great advantages of using something like this in a headquarters, and I haven't really focused on headquarters. I was talking to the army yesterday, or two guys from the army who were responsible for putting together the doctrine for future headquarters is a, a headquarters at the moment for an armoured division and allegedly the British have an armoured division. <laughs> but uh, it's got 350 users, 350 laptops. They don't use Wi-Fi because that's insecure. So it's all cabled together. It comes in 18 ISO containers. It takes three days just to establish the headquarters, to get it running. It also comes with its own generators. It's called the field, the field power, field power electrical, FPEs. These things have their own dedicated prime movers, massive trailer, huge output, 
three phase, the rest of it. The problem is they're a massive target. They'll be seen, they'll be heard, they'll be detected. And they're indicative, a signature, an indicative of something major being there, even if they don't detect the rest of it via the emissions from all the radios, the satellite comms, whatever else, movement in and out. So they want to separate all of these. And what they want to be able to do is replace the generators altogether. Now, someone's got something that said there are hybrid generators, right? They're really good. They're going to work. But yeah, again, they're not fast charging. It's not instant power. So we see an ISO container worth of power being deposited at a sensible distance from where it's consumed and then being replaced. That's in the logistics chain, where it gets recharged and what it's recharged for, hopefully by solar, but it's not going to be solar anywhere near the front, nor is it going to be wind turbines. It's just not going to happen. Not in the near future. As much as I like the idea of that, it's not going to happen in the near future. So that whole electrical... So what I think what we're dealing with is the future is electrification for most Western armies. It's been delayed because of the realities of what's happening in Ukraine and the threat that today's Russia presents all of us, essentially. I don't think anyone can deny now that it, it, it's a problem. It's a major problem. So getting stuff, power to the guys in the front, the front line, the tactical edge, that's where the priority is. And that's where I think ZPN have an instant set of solutions. I'm, I'm, I'm done now with that diatribe. I'm happy to take questions as long as they're not technical. You only have to look at me and you go, ha, he can't do maths. So, and that'd be right. But I'm happy to take any other questions you've got. I, I get the impression because I, I, I watch the Ukraine development with interest and the techno technological use and yeah. everyday things. But I always pictured that the army or the government would have a, 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 a 007 type Q character somewhere in the background inventing all of this stuff for when <laughs> events like that happen. And it turns out there isn't any one. No, because, because we haven't really been at war, right? There have been conflicts. Yeah. So the Falklands War... Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> so defence is, is, is still considered to be important, but a minor importance compared with where we were, you know, in 1938, for instance, entering into a war. Everything we've done thereafter, and I was in the army for 31 years, so I've done some of that, has been a conflict. <coughs> And it's semantics, but the important thing is, from a political perspective, if you go to the war, the British army, under our unwritten constitution, has to increase in size by one third. That's expensive. So we don't declare war anymore. We, get, we have conflicts, right? We had the Falklands conflict. It makes me uncomfortable because Putin is not at war. He's a special military operation, right? So, like, oh, Christ, he's learned a thing or two from us. So... The other thing, I think, that's stifled innovation in defence, particularly in this country, is that successive governments of any colour have always been keen to maintain a sovereign capability, however they view that, in terms of defence engineering, because that's where great innovation comes from, and then stifled it by merely dealing with four or five massive primes, as we would call them, and the primes are businesses with shareholders and their only interest, particularly when there isn't an existential threat to the, to the country, their only interest is making money. Not necessarily to pay their highly inflated wages, and they are. I used to work for Talis, so I was paid very well, more than I was worth, that's for certain. But uh, so they pay these guys, and it's just in their interest to make everything last longer in terms of a development program and squeeze as much money as they can out of a very naive user, because the user often isn't technically astute enough to understand what's going on. Right? He, the army thinks in terms of capability. I need to move a section of men from here to there, 300 kilometers in this time at this altitude. And that's his capability statement. He's not, he's not declaring it's a helicopter. It kind of, kind of will be. And that's their get out. No, 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 you're all the geeks. You, you tell us how you're going to do it. We're just the users. We're the people that kick down the doors and, you know, pull the trigger. So they fed off that. And the civil service, it's like a huge frozen middle 
in MOD, the civil service, is where all the piss poor civil servants get posted, I think. And they're just about process. And the process is. And then they introduced an enormous raft of ESG policy, which really hasn't helped defense. It slowed everything down. Adhering to every policy on, for instance, you know, and these are urgent operational requirements. You know, what is your policy on social impact in the area that your business is based? Please describe how this is benefiting primary schools. It's a bomb. <laughs> but uh, so that's where we ended up. And, and a key figure is the American Department of Defense procures 25% of its capability from SMEs. Britain, less than 5%. Less than 5%. I'd say it's less than yeah, no doubt. And we've had some oh, just filling in the paperwork <laughs> to address a tender. Well, yeah. The appetite for nowadays for British manufactured products. My um, cousin, uh, Ollie, was, I don't know what the rank is, but he was in charge of a squadron of helicopters. And then when he retired, sort of, um, he then consulted on the what the helicopters were, but they had this issue where the gearboxes they've manufactured the helicopters with were cheap, but they were not capable of operating <laughs> above forty percent. Yeah. So they then had to, and they were foreign. So they then had to go in and replace all the. Gearboxes. You almost said French. I'm going to assume that they're French. <laughs> we we we've never built helicopters unless we've collaborated with France in doing so yeah, in the past. And, but how do you un un overcome that from a procurement process? In the political attitudes of yeah. versus buying British. So for a while I was an independent consultant and I actually worked in, in the Far East presenting solutions. Right. Uh, to legitimate, I hasten to add, we wouldn't deal with any uh, nefarious governments, but legitimate governments in the Far East. And, and everything that the British did was considered to be e excellent. Yeah. So it was either American or British. And, and so that's the reputation. So, yeah, sometimes we get that wrong. Yeah. Or, or if anything that the, you know, the RAF was using must be good, yeah. tends to be the view. And it's naive. Yeah. But, yeah, the primes feed off that as well. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's denuded the amount of innovation in defense. I mean, software writers, we heard it before from James, right? They go to fintech because that's where the money is. They're not going into defense. It just wasn't cool, and it's certainly not ESG. Um, it might not be cool, but it's kind of a bit of a necessity these days, I, I think, because we are approaching another war. Um, that's not me warmongering. I'm just sat here watching it come over the hill at me. Does that answer the question? Yeah, it does. Kind of. Yeah, I, so I, I, I failed, I'd, I'd like basically. To the rewarding, <laughs> like, the that, but, you know. Yeah, no. I mean, sadly, we're. Yeah. It's every every time people complain, they say they're going to change it, and then they don't. Yeah, so kind of two years ago, they made a big announcement, and that man Shaps. <laughs> I almost swore again, but that man Shaps makes announcements every week about how things are changing and how wonderful things are. And look at this laser it's shooting down drones and we've got a new tank that's the most deadly in the world at a time where tanks are all being killed within five minutes. Yeah. That's great. But uh, he made an announcement a couple of years, uh, it was about last year, I think, shortly after he took over from Ben Wallace, uh, saying we're going to involve so many more SMEs because that's where the real innovation is. They don't. What happens is if you've got something really interesting, <laughs> the civil servants would go, oh, that's marvellous. That seems to tick all the boxes. Uh, but the trouble is you're very small and you don't have five million in the bank. I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll introduce you to British Aerospace and they'll do with you. And then you're herded towards British Aerospace and say, right, we're going to buy six of those now. We won't pay you for 120 days. Get out. Oh, and the price has to come down. Sharpen your pencils. The price has to come down 20%. And then you get the supply chain effect where they say it's cheaper to do that bit from China. So... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, they're waking up to that now because, I mean, it's not, it's not that 
anything that's Chinese is suspect in terms of security. It's just that if China appears to have the intent to attack Taiwan, then there are going to be massive sanctions and that supply chain will dry up overnight. So you need predictability in your supply chain uh, above and beyond everything else, actually. So don't be buying Chinese stuff now from the military, because if Xi decides that enough's enough and he's going into Taiwan, then you're not going to have access to that. So we need to replicate anything that we're buying, particularly for defense technology in China, needs to be replicated here. I mean, there's an argument that actually there's a lot of, I think, uh, unwelcome tech transfer to China over the decades, right? Yeah. Virus, via various networks. So we should be exploiting the stuff that we conceived of decades ago. We should be manufacturing that back in, in the West. Yeah. Chips, chips is an obvious one, right? Yeah, we and the interesting thing, we sort of are effectively in the fleet of mobility, so certainly mm. in the fleet business, and we've been having conversations about taking on hundreds, of thousands of cars very fast, and had conversations with Chinese manufacturers, but of course, like in another business, we had the Huawei problem with the 5G rollout. So, yeah. So, and what we don't want to do is have a fleet of cars all on our app. The problem is, yeah, they're all connected. The, Anything that's connected. Yeah, because one of the other things that we're dealing with is, is cyber security. Yeah. Uh, we've got a partner that produces British conceived and developed quantum encryption. Yeah. And the way that it's been explained to us is what the, the, the Central Committee of China is doing is it's scarfing up, harvesting as much data as it possibly can and storing it. It can't decrypt it yet. AES-256 can be decrypted. It just takes, you know, the resources, the NSA, 72 hours to decrypt one email. So you haven't got time for that shit. But when quantum computing arrives, they can scarf it all up. So if one of your cars, for instance, drives through, I don't know, the shipyard at Rothscythe, come the algorithms that are developing in China and quantum computing, that algorithm will sweep through all of that data and go, aha, We've got a location report here from a car 18 months ago. Let's see what it's... And you've no idea what data's been transferred back. So yeah. if it's got onboard cameras, and they all do... We can't go somewhere a British manufacturer and buy effectively... No. ...thousand cars effectively, cost-effectively, that we can trust. Yeah, you could buy an encryption, but uh, that's me upselling, trying to, desperately. Yeah, but then you're subject to the uh, political Absolutely. decision, because they won't understand the encryption. They'll just make a political decision. Yeah. So, like with Hawaii, which is, you know, understand reasoning, but wasn't necessarily legitimate reasoning, reasoning from a technical point of view. Yeah. Dealt with it. I, yeah, I've, I've heard those arguments about a thousand times, and yeah. you've got to err on the side of caution, yeah. essentially, when it comes right. to. The same applies to us, but the car yeah. is just. Kind yeah. Of, you know, um, well, what are the alternatives? They're all expensive, right? So, you know, build the gigabit factories and build British cars. Yeah, he's going to have political will to do that as well. Mm. I mean, some of the discussions we've had in this room right now have kind of chilled me a bit, and I think it should chill a lot of people in terms of what we're discussing in terms of the future coming war. Obviously, we've talked about things like cyber security. Do you think, obviously, that potentially is going to be the future of, like, sort of warfare? Which uh, it absolutely is, yeah. Well, we heard a story, we heard a story uh, about a month ago about LED lamps being used by the Department of Defense in America, and they've just stripped out 600,000 because they discovered, because they randomly sampled them, they discovered microphones in them. And these, these are IoT devices, so you know, as you get an app, you can switch on the lights before you get there, yada, yada, yada. But also, it's transmitting recorded conversations in the room to wherever. Yeah. I, I would like to think today that we don't have to discuss the prospects of the future of the coming wars, but we, we, well, we it, you know what, I always, I was, when was the last time a democracy declared war on another democracy? You just want to think about that one. What is democracy? <laughs> <laughs> I think we're over that. <laughs> there we go. Thanks for your time, anyway. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, if you guys want to...
Thank you.